Today, I'm talking to Zeno Rocha. He runs Recent. He's the CEO of an email company for developers, but he's also an indie hacker, which is really cool. In our conversation, we're going to tackle the differences between indie hacking and being VC funded, how we can bring this together, how he runs a company with seven people that just supplies indie hackers and software engineers of all sizes with reliable email through an API, what his world looks like, what his challenges are, and all these wonderful things. This episode is sponsored by Acquire.com. More on that later. Now here's Sino. Hey, Sino, you said something back in January 2023. You said, we are building a communications platform and we're starting with email. So my question to you right now is, are you done with email just yet? Can And can you ever be truly done with email? Man, uh... I think when I started Resend, I never thought how hard <laughs> it would be to build an email company, especially an email company uh, tailored to developers. So the quick answer is no, we're not done with email. There's a lot we still need to do. We've been focusing a lot on the sending part, but there's a lot of interesting use cases around the receiving part as well. So this is one of the areas that we're focusing right now, inbound emails. And yeah. Email is wild. It's so right? hard. <laughs> <laughs> I do wonder what are the things that you that you never thought you were gonna run into. Like I have a couple on my mind, but I would like to hear what the actual journey was for you. I feel like there's an angle of email that uh, very people know about when it comes to anti abuse. So we all know that there's a lot of phishing emails and a lot of people sending spam emails and a lot of bad actors in that space in general. We, we get that feeling because we have a hard time ourselves to control our inboxes, right? But as an email provider uh, that needs to worry about the reputation of the IPs on that shared IP pool, uh, that needs to worry about how one bad actor can impact other good actors, uh, there's just like a huge amount of energy that I personally put and the rest of the, the team also puts in terms of anti-abuse that no one knows about. And we created so many systems internally uh, and we even call it like RoboCop, you know, that's like the, <laughs> our little machine nice. that helps uh, <laughs> deal with that. And it's just so wild. I never thought I would spend so much time fighting spam and, and phishing, uh, which is crazy. Yeah, that, it's actually interesting because I think that kind of technology, that's the actual innovation in the space, right? Like email, t technically the protocol has been around for 40, 50 years or something. It's been quite, quite a while, but having to deal with criminal or, you know, uh, Ill illegal activities and fighting that, the whole cat and mouse game, that's where most of the innovation happens. Am I right with that? That's so true because what happens is that, uh, and that this was one of my motivations when I started, I was like, man, when I go to Postmark or SES or SendGrid and I start to, you know, just set up a new account, they ask me all these questions. And then I, I have to go through a two day verification process where they're vetting if my use case is allowed or not and that kind of stuff. And I was just so pissed about that. I'm like, Oh my gosh. Like I just want to send an email. I don't want to be, you know, like, what is this? Do I need to send a photo of my passport now? Like what's the deal here? And I'm like, we got to remove friction. That's just like, just not ideal at all. Uh, and now I know why they do it because there's so many bad actors. But the way we're trying to solve this problem is we're not going to put friction on the user side. We're putting friction on, uh, on us. You know, like we have to do the work to make sure that we detect, uh, bad actors faster, but we cannot make the experience of good actors bad because of these guys. So how can we can create like the most optimal experience for people who are legit that just want to send an email that they're starting something new, a side project that they don't know if it's going to work or not. So I like, why like do I need to spend a, like wait a week or two days waiting for a response if I just want to try something out. So we're trying to trust users by default instead of the opposite, uh, which is not the common path that uh, email platforms take. That sounds like as you target the service more to developers and being one yourself, you can probably have a little bit more trust. I mean, I know there's like people who are really into hacking, like the, the bad, the black hat kind of stuff. But I think on average, developers probably have a more 
you know, rule based and rule following behavior. Is that right? Like, have you seen developers actually being more or less criminal in that regard or abusive? Let's just say abusive at, at this point. Yeah, that's a tough one because I don't really know the, the pain that other companies feel, right? So it's hard to compare, but I feel like they, they are definitely like the type of people that uh, they recognize when something is good or not. They are willing to give feedback. And for me, the way I, I treat developer feedback is that they will only give you once. And if you don't act on that feedback, you'll never hear from them again. But the, the type of feedback they give is so valuable. Like they will go in so much detail. And if you can really act on that feedback, they will keep coming and they will keep helping you build that product. Um, so it's definitely hard. And there are all these analogies of like, oh, if you're building for developers, you're trying to, you know, uh, cook for other chefs. Yeah. You know, Th yeah. there's this idea that uh, developers can spot things uh, pretty quickly. Uh, and uh, so it's it's been a an amazing journey to serve that audience. Uh, and as a developer myself, I just, yeah, I just love it. Yeah, I bet. And, and as a developer myself, I wonder, how do you get developers to talk to you? Because they don't like talking to people. Like right? They don't necessarily, I mean, some people really like to write these four page like ideas that they have and send them over. But most devs are pretty busy building their own stuff. So how do you encourage people to give you feedback? Like, where do you, where do you get them to actually give you anything meaningful? Yeah, I think it goes back to removing friction because uh, I feel like most of the time people are trying to hide the contact support forms or like hide the, the feedback button. And I remember uh, debating or, or uh, in terms of like where should the feedback button be and what are the fields that we're going to have in that experience. And we tried to make it, you know, as less friction as possible. There's like a button on every single page you click. There's like a text area and then there's no form like, oh, is this a bug? Is this a feature request? Or like, what is your sentiment as you're giving that feedback? No, just like here's a, uh, a text area, click send, uh, the message goes to us and then it's up to us to uh, act fast uh, on that. That's cool. Yeah, it, it, it sounds like you exactly know <laughs> how people use your tool, right? You, you know how much effort they're going to put into it and how little effort they want to put into giving you something for free. I think that's a that's an important one. I wonder, and, and this is a kind of almost a, a business future question, how long you can keep this going, right? Because usually as businesses grow, their capacity to deal with the influx of feedback diminishes a little bit and particularly the speed at which they can react to it which like you said is important right you you only get feedback once and if you don't act on it they will never help you again how do you plan to keep this feedback loop tight in the business i feel like there's some battles that uh you as a founder you have to choose if you're willing to die on that sword uh sort of speak uh and there's some battles that you know that as you grow, you have to be more flexible and maybe like, you know, uh, be a little bit more uh, relaxed with that rule. Uh, for me, there's some things that I believe that are very deep uh, that I I will die on that sword. Uh, one of them is attention to detail. I feel like to build a, a great product, you need to slowly add those moments of joy and there could be no... Uh, broken windows, you know, just yesterday, there was a page where you would load the page and then the loading state will be in one. And then once the content was loaded, it will jump a little bit. And I told the team, can we fix this right now? Because this is not good. Uh, so if you go to that extreme of like, no, like we have to really take care of the details and that's what makes a great product. That's something that as we scale, I'll, I'll keep to you know keep pushing on that, um, and you know responding to feedback is another one. Uh, every churn that you have, every message that you receive, like feature request, every ticket that someone opens on your support channel, that's an opportunity for learning. And if you don't take 
advantage of that opportunity, you're just missing out. You're missing out on building a, a better product. So, you know, receiving that message is a privilege and you have to like, you're like receiving gold in your hand. And if you're just dismissing that, then you don't really care about your product that much uh, as you're saying you care. So I value that a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to say we're perfect. We make a lot of mistakes. There are a lot of feedback that we don't act as quickly as we, we want it to be. We're super small team um, and we're serving a lot. Like we are now a team of seven people. We're serving 100,000 users uh, in the platform. They're sending millions of emails every single day. Uh, so how can we keep scaling uh, without necessarily just putting more people on the problem, right? It's always the challenge. So yeah, those are some of the things that I, I, I'll die on, on that sort. Yeah, it also sounds like that with a team of seven, you still look at these emails, at the feedback that people give you, right? Oh, it's not yeah. that you kind of push <laughs> it away. Like you sound like the guy who would just want to read every single one of them at this point. For sure. And what's re what's even more important than me reading those emails is also for the engineering team to to get to have access to that data. I feel like a lot of teams they try to shield the engineering group from like customer feedback. And then there's this gatekeeper, this product manager or the support team that compiles that data and then give that data to engineers. And I've always subscribed to the idea that, you know, engineers need to be talking to users. They need to have access to the support system. Uh, the Zendesk uh, system can't, cannot be like separated and engineers cannot have like a, a license or a seat. No, like engineers should be able to go to the support tool and answer questions themselves. So that's super important. Yeah, I, I recall being in a lot of companies that had this kind of divide. And they mostly did it because they thought us engineers, we wouldn't be able to speak the language of the client. And which is funny because in, in all of these businesses, we were talking to technical people, like we were serving other technical people with our technical product. And I think in your case, even more so, right? It's developers building for developers. Like if there's anybody who should speak to these customers that you have, it's your development team. They know their language. They know exactly the, you know, the little slogans and the, the lingo of, of the community. They know what people want, what they, what they need. I love the fact that you kind of keep this in the team. Um, how, how do you avoid like, pulling people out of their flow state because that's that's something developers really need right and your customer service conversations they come in when they come in so how do you how do you keep people focused on their work while still being involved in the customer service world yeah that's something i still struggle a lot you know and we've been trying different strategies different ways to to handle that because the, the truth is that we cannot just have all the engineers doing supports every single day right uh, otherwise they can't get stuff done and as a developer myself, I know that I need my focus time. I need that time block. Uh, I can't have like multiple meetings in between. Otherwise I'm, I'm going to lose context. Uh, so it's something we, we have a hard time doing it, but we, we try to like come up with different stuff and different strategies, uh, or initiatives to, to create that culture. So, uh, just last week, we we're all like traveling for our offsite. We are a remote team. So everybody works from home. And we went to Mexico for a week. And then on the first day uh, when we were there, uh, we knew that, okay, the week is going to start and we're going to be in meetings all day. So how can we um, like make sure we handle all the support load before so we have more room to, to do all the brainstorm sessions? So then on Sunday night, we all sat down and then we're like, we're doing support night and everybody has to help. Uh, so... Th those are the types of things that we do. And then, you know, maybe an engineer that is not that involved with support, they might be thinking like, oh, yeah, oh, this is cool. Interesting. Oh, look at all these problems. And engineers are lazy, right? Most of them. And when they see something, they're like, oh, wow, like, I can't believe people are having these problems. Let me fix that for them because they, they shouldn't be having these things. So I, yeah, I feel like it's so important. But I wish I had the the answer uh, <laughs> to the question because well you do and it's trying to make it better step by step right that's what it is like you just try to figure out how you can involve people without like taking away their focus time and that is always I think it's a unique process for every business because first of what you build 
depends it, that uh, on that depends like how focused you need to be and what your customers have as problems also impacts that right so that that's the unique part there uh, you you said you were remote that's that's unsurprising i guess in a in a post pandemic world but it is it is pretty cool with a team of seven like how how distributed are you like is are time zones already a problem in the in the business at this size or are you still waiting for that to be an issue later yeah no i i actually think a lot about what is the best setup for an early remote team? And I feel like that looks pretty different uh, in terms of what are the skills you need? What are the time zones that, you, that you're that you open to? And I had that experience at WorkOS when, when I used to work before. And we were a team of like 50 people. And back then, we were very strict about what are the time zones that we hire. So we still didn't have people in Europe or, or Asia because we wanted to keep the time zones in between like North America and South and, and Central America. So that's pretty much how we, we also behave here. Like, okay, we're a small team. We, we try to hire people as senior as possible because we don't have too much time for training and, and developing. Like we just need to get stuff done and, and learn as quickly as possible. And we also need to be able to have some sort of uh, overlap between our work, not full overlap. We actually don't believe that that's the case. We, we very much believe in, in working async and having everything around like async work. Uh, but some overlap is good. So that's how we, we try to do. So we, we have like people in North America, people in, in South America today. And then we have that like four hour gap, uh, between those time zones. That's cool. That's still that's pr- it's pretty close, right? It's 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 not the other side of the world, but yeah, I, I could see that. It, I'm I'm kind of I'm mesmerized by the fact that it's just seven people because like you went through YC, which is something that a lot of people aspire to, and I guess a lot of people in the in the hacker world have very strong opinions about. You know, like Daniel Vasallo has written extensively about this, and a lot of people are mirroring the the idea that oh no, I never would raise VC because uh, I want to bootstrap and all of that. But I see you do it, and still have some kind of sustainability built in and a very a strong focus on like team cohesion and actually like moving forward in a in a kind of less crazy way than what most people attribute to the v, the VC money world. So it's great to to get like a glimpse behind the curtain here. How has going into YC impacted the trajectory of this business? Like, because you're defying expectations on my end, right? You don't have 400 engineers right now. And I thought everybody is trying to grow as much as they can. So what else am I missing here? What's what's the, the magic there? You know, it's super interesting. Uh, I, I'm an indie hacker. You know, I only started recent because indie hackers inspired me. Indie hackers like you, indie hackers like Daniel. And so many others. Uh, I remember starting Dracula Pro and then like going through all that journey and then making my first dollar online and, and being like so puzzled about like, how <laughs> can people really, you know, you know, uh, put their credit card information and buy this thing for me. And then waking up and seeing the Stripe notifications or the Gumroad notifications, yes. which I still use every single day. Uh, <laughs> And selling books uh, and being inspired by your journey as a self-publishing uh, author, same same for me. So I went through that journey and I noticed the pros and cons of being an indie hacker. Uh, and I feel like that's the same for the VC route. Uh, there's pros and cons. And when I looked at the business that I was building with Dracula, for example, I'm like, I, I'm pretty sure this is a lifestyle business, plain and simple. It's real. Like, how can I scale, you know, selling colors online? It's hard, uh, you know? Right. Uh, and I have so many ideas to grow that committee and I still do that on weekends and, and, and during the evening. Um, but that was a lifestyle business. That's an indie hacker business. Great. When I had the idea for recent, I knew this is the type of business that requires capital. I need for as a developer myself, I really believe I need a generous free tier because I want to empower other indie hackers. And I know that 
when they're just getting started, they need a way to try it out. And then if it plays out uh, and then, okay, this is good. Okay. Then they'll start paying later. So whenever I see people trashing the VC route, I'm always surprised by that because I feel like they don't really understand like for this type of business, this is the route you should go. And for that other type, there's another route versus this is the only way you should do it. I feel like there's a lot of nuance that, that uh, folks miss. And I remember like uh, seeing people like saying bad things about YC and there's something really interesting about, you know, maybe you don't like the person who runs it. Maybe you don't like the idea of an accelerator. Uh, or the model that they execute, uh, whatever is the thing that you don't like about them. I don't really care the the, the root cause, so the, the main reason. Maybe you were rejected three times and now you absolutely hate it and you feel like, you know, I don't like those guys are evil. Okay, I don't really care. Uh, what, I, what I don't think is nice is when people just think that, okay, every YC company is bad because YC is bad. You know, uh, and I remember when we had an incident, uh, with recent and there was a lot of attention around that. I saw that type of behavior and I was like kind of disappointed with that. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, everybody has their opinions, you know, and, and it's fine. Uh, but I would definitely recommend folks that if they either think that just the VC route is, I, it's perfect. This is the way to go. Stop for a second and think like, okay, maybe there's something on the other side. And same for indie hackers. Look at that and then think like, for the type of thing am I that I'm building, is this the right funding model? If it is, great, go for it. If it's not, there's another route. Uh, I personally wanted to experience both and I still do every single day. I, I still see all the, the Stripe uh, yes. transactions on recent. I still see all the Dracula transactions on Gumroad and all the uh, Amazon uh, thing too uh, with, with self-publishing the book. That's so, right. You got KDP. Yeah, that's right. The KDP, exactly. Yeah. The KDP thing. I still see the, the their emails. So yeah, uh, the, there's a lot to unpack there, but I, I feel like uh, folks need to experience those things by themselves before really talking about it yeah i i like that very balanced nuanced approach like obviously different uh, business models require different kinds of funding and different founders have different ways of going about business right it's like some people can be indie hackers forever and be perfectly fine like peter levels comes to mind i don't think he he would be the guy that takes on funding but who knows maybe there's an opportunity like maybe he will find his recent one day Right? Like you never know. And, and I don't think you should close off the opportunity to, to if hiring, um, a lot of people and needing a lot of money or having high expenses. Like it's kind of what I'm going through with Podscan right now. Like I need to pay all these GPU servers in the cloud. And if, if I hadn't raised some money from the calm company fund, I would have to like pay this all by myself, which I probably could. But then again, I don't need to. There are funding solutions in between bootstrapping and VC as well, right? There's a, there's a continuum. And you, you, I, what I love about your journey is that you, that you still are both. This is so cool. It's so cool to see somebody not leaving indie hacking for greener pastures, but just saying, okay, I'm going to do this as well. That's nice. That's, that's rare, I think. And that's why people have these split opinions, right? Because it's either or people go do other things. But you're still you're still in both thing in both uh, grounded in realities and both realities there. I like that. And w- cool. what's really cool is that a lot of the way I act today is so influenced by my indie hacker path, and I bring that to the team. You know, like oh, this mentality, like the sense of urgency, like the sense of uh, scarcity is like we gotta ship it. Like we we don't have time. Like w- we got to really think about this one thing we can do because as an indie hacker, you're typically working, you know, just these two hours on a Friday (laughs) night, you know? So with those two hours, you got to be so focused. And I bring that to the team. And and just like the, the opposite is also true, right? Like now that I'm going through that VC route, uh, I see like these founders that have like these super ambitious uh, vision, right? And they're like, Oh yeah, we're, 
you know, for recent, it's like, oh, we're going to help humans communicate. It's so broad. It's so like, uh, you know, uh, inspirational. And then I'm like, you know, it's actually cool to have that, that audacity. And then I bring that audacity to my anti hacker business. So with Dracula, I'm like, we're building the biggest theme on earth. And that's what Dracula is going to be. It's going to be available everywhere and every single developer should use it. Cool. Not, so I love that, you know, that opportunity. Uh, I feel like it's an opportunity. It, it really is. And I, what I like, like particularly, there's a dream, right? There's a dream to help everybody communicate or all developers communicate more easily. You can probably like just size it down into niches and it's still a big dream. And it's still a big dream to help every developer out there build like better emails or write better emails, send better emails. That is already like audacious as a goal. And then taking this into these small projects and small, I mean, by just like tightly scoped, that's also great because why not make the best theme? Like Dracula is great. I think I'm a customer. I was back then. And it's like, yeah, this is great. This is not like the, the, the biggest revolution in technology, but it's going to help me be better at my job or it's going to make life more enjoyable. And that is already a lot, right? It's already a lot to have that dream to make it a really cool thing that people can use and will use every day. I think dreaming is all right. It's all right to dream a little bit and take that into your business. That's so true. And you said something that that's so impactful because I feel like uh, we're not reinventing the wheel here, right? Like you, you said it before, like email existed for the past 50 years. It's probably going to exist for the, the next 50. Uh, and it's not like there are no email solutions out there. There's actually plenty of them. Uh, and we're trying to take a new spin on an existing problem and just trying to solve it for this niche. That's something I learned with in, being an indie hacker. I just got to nail down this one niche. And if I do it, then I have the opportunity to grow to other niches as well. Uh, so I remember for a long time, uh, I thought that to be an entrepreneur, you had to just like come up with something that no one ever thought about. It, it got to be revolutionary or, uh, yeah. and I, I learned that that's definitely not the case. There's actually a lot of opportunity, especially now when so many people are looking at AI as this shiny object and everybody is like a gold rush. Uh, everybody going to that side. I, I feel like there's so much opportunity for India hackers to look at existing products and say, you know what? Google Analytics is not that good. Maybe I could build an alternative to that. Oh, like, I don't know. Jira is not that good. Maybe I can build an alternative to that. And you see with Plausible and with Linear, they took two different paths. One is a VC-backed company. Another is an indie hacker, a bootstrap company. Uh, so I don't know. I feel like... uh yeah, uh, this is the best time to build, and uh, and it doesn't have to be something that no one ever thought about. Yeah, I think your approach of like really all, sweating the details, I think, is the phrase, right? Like really caring about the you, you can you can see it on the recent homepage. This is a well constructed homepage, and it looks cool. Like it just you know like it it immediately invites you into like uh, you can feel that the people who built this they probably care about quality product. And I think that speaks the language. I think in a marketing sense, you did a really good job conveying how much you care about quality because like developers can see this. They, we, we all have seen the documentation pages of weird software from the nineties. Like we have memories of the shittiest websites that have information on them that we could barely read, could barely parse. It's unstructured. It's really bad. So we know what bad looks like. And then you come and you provide this wonderful website that is clear, that has messaging that is very approachable to a, a logical, analytical mind. That suggests that you know what you're doing. And I, I wonder how much work went into that because that feels like a lot of effort on the <laughs> website, man. Dude, it was so much work. <laughs> and there were so many times that we were like, okay, it's been months that we're developing this or weeks. This is getting out of hand. Uh, are we doing the right thing or not by spending so much time on the website? And there were many times that we were like, okay, let's launch it. 
next Monday. And then Monday comes, they were like, uh, it's not there yet. <laughs> and then we're like, okay, next Monday then. And then mm, it's not there yet. And that's something I, I truly feel like it's an opportunity too for indie hackers because there's this MVP mentality, right? Like you got to ship fast. You got to validate as fast as possible. And that's all true. Like uh, I, I, I don't disagree with that. My point is that people then cut a lot of corners and they, they miss the opportunity to communicate something deeper. So speaking of free send, you go to the website. First thing you see this crazy Rubik's cube rotating in front of you. What's that about? Like, what's that related to email or developer tools? What's the deal with that? And for me, the, the important thing about that is that it communicates a lot of things. It communicates that, hey, this is different. This is not SendGrid. This is something else. Oh, this is, there's a technical excellence here that I don't see elsewhere. So if this is good, imagine what's behind this. And the attention to detail. Oh, this is a team that cares. So if I have an issue, they'll, they'll probably care uh, to help me. And I could create a values page and talk about all of the things that we care as a team and then write that down. Or I can demonstrate on the most important real estate that I have on the web, which is the first load on my homepage. And... I highly recommend indie hackers to do the same. Like how can you communicate the things that you value and that your audience values? And there's just a sense of giving back that I, I cannot articulate. I wish I could. But when you see something and you're like, oh, these people care. Oh, by you just like you also care by by extent that there's just something weird about humans i i can't explain i think there's something, something. There. i think i think it's, it's absolutely show don't tell right you, you show them and by doing it you you make them aware of it as you, you don't you have to promise something and then maybe you fulfill it later like here it is an example of your craftsmanship and all of that and i think you do this not just on the website which is great but also in all the integrations that you have like and that you actively pursue like I, you, you've been You've been trying your open source stuff, like all the integrations into different tools. That's really cool. And did I hear something about yeah, you going more into the world of PHP? Is that maybe something that's going to happen? Yeah, that's so true. You know, like we know there's a revival in in the PHP community uh, of some sorts. Uh, PHP has been around for a long time, and uh, the community is still extremely active, despite what other communities might say about it. Uh, so one of the cool things that I'm super excited about is that uh, Taylor, the creator of Laravel, I I stumbled upon him on an event and he was just like on this circle with me. And then I just mentioned something about uh, someone that he just had hired. And then he's like, oh, so yeah, what do you work on? I'm like, oh, recent. And he's like, oh, I actually uh, developed like a, a transport layer and, and, and I committed that into Laravel. I'm nice. like, really? He's like, yeah. And Surprise. I'm like, when, yeah, well, when are you shipping this? I'm like, oh, I just need to push the commit and, and then we're, we're good. Uh, I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Awesome. Uh, so, so cool. yeah, recent is now uh, like a, a core the transport layer on, on Laravel. And then that was super cool because then the folks from Symphony saw that and they got inspired by that. And now Recent is also part of Symphony. Uh, and we're just trying to make the lives of developers easier. Whatever, you know, channel or technology you use, like another case uh, is with uh, Cloudflare workers. Uh, the folks from Cloudflare, they reached out to me last year talking about like, oh, how we can integrate Recent. Uh, there's a lot of people asking for that. And we didn't have too much time to work anything uh, with them. So then they came this year again. They're like, man, there's a lot of people using recent Cloudflare workers. We should do something. And now we have like an official integration with them too. They added recent on their docs. And I'm like, just so happy that uh, we're building this ecosystem. You know, uh, as a developer, there are tools that I love and every developer loves a different tool. So whatever you love, we want to be there. We're working on a Rust SDK at this very moment. So there's a lot of cool stuff coming. That's cool. And again, this shows like how much you care about this particular community. And that's that's what what I hear. Like you you could probably have just skipped Rust, you know, or skip skip Laravel for that matter, and just went for Rails or you know like pick your thing. But to actually be inclusive and give give everybody who 
has a preference, a choice of integration, that speaks to me as somebody who has missed out on a lot of these in the past because these businesses were way too far gone from me, right? Way too, way too, they didn't care about me as like the, the simple single solopreneur developer. They only wanted to reach other enterprise businesses, but you don't do that. And I love this. And I hope you can keep this up for as long as possible. That's, that's yes. really what I hope, right? <laughs> because the, the, the markets change and you have growth expectations and all that. But I see that, that uh, you're trying, you're trying to stick with devs for as long as you can. And it's really cool. Yeah, man. Yeah, thanks a lot, Arvid. Means a lot coming from you for sure. <laughs> well, I I will keep my eye on on recent. I I think I I have a, a free account there, and I think I might migrate Podscan over to the thing now that it's also in Laravel as like a baseline thing. That's just awesome. I really love this, and I I yeah, it's, it's so funny, right? But that you didn't necessarily intend to have this happen, but it just happened because you were at the right place at the right time, talking to the right people. Like if there's a lesson in there for founders. It's be at conferences, be at events, go to meetups, like hang out with other makers in the space and see what kind of partnerships just happen by random chance, right? And what kind of opportunities can come from this? You have to be present in the space and things can happen. That's really cool. Yeah, that's serendipity awesome. is yeah. something that, you know, uh, you got to use at your advantage. And when you're building something from scratch, uh, you just got to use every little opportunity you can to to you know uh, make it better so well i i see you do this and i i see you like, sharing all of this in public as well which i really appreciate so if people want to find out more about recent about your journey which has been but what since like 2009 or something you've been publicly communicating this on your blog as well like man there's so much here that we didn't even get to talk about but if people want to follow you and the business that you're that you're building where should they go yeah, so I'm super active on X. So uh, x.com slash Zeno Rocha uh, is where you can find me posting random stuff. And uh, also, you know, resend because I'm super active on uh, on my personal account. I'm also uh, on our business account. So we're every day posting new stuff that we're shipping. Uh, so at resend on, on X and everywhere like zenorocha.com, you can find all my talks, all my podcasts articles everything i built uh yeah that's cool man yeah these are these are great locations i highly recommend following zeno here that's yeah you're great and i'm what i'm really really grateful for is that you're bringing the indie hacker mentality into yc and into the world of vc i think that's that's quite the feat and and something that you're that you're actively helping both communities communicate more and kind of see the good in each other i think that's that's something that i really enjoy about your work and the way you just explained it to me here on the show really appreciate it thank you so much for being on and and sharing all these insights that, that was really cool. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank you, man. You've been a, an inspiration for a long time. So I'm I'm super glad uh, we're having this this discussion yes. here. This that awesome. was really cool. Appreciate it. And that's it for today. I will now briefly thank my sponsor, Acquire.com. Imagine this. You're a founder who's built a really solid SaaS product. You acquired all those customers and everything is generating really consistent monthly recurring revenue. That's the dream of every SaaS founder, right? Problem is you're not growing for whatever reason. Maybe it's lack of skill or lack of focus or applying lack of interest. You don't know. You just feel stuck in your business with your business. What should you do? Well, the story that I would like to hear is that you buckled down, you reignited the fire, and you started working on the business, not just in the business. And all those things you did, like audience building and marketing and sales and outreach, they really helped you to go down this road, six months down the road, making all that money. You tripled your revenue and you have this hyper successful business. That is the dream. The reality, unfortunately, is not as simple as this. And the situation that you might find yourself in is looking different for every single founder who is facing this crossroad. This problem is common, but it looks different every time. But what doesn't look different every time is the story that here it just ends up being one of inaction and stagnation because the business becomes less and less valuable over time and then eventually completely worthless if you don't do anything. So if you find yourself here, Already at this point, or you think your story is likely headed down a similar road, I would consider a third option, and that is selling a business on Acquire.com. Because you capitalizing on the value of your time today is a pretty smart move. It's certainly better than not doing anything. And Acquire.com is free to list. They've helped hundreds of founders already. Just go check it out at try.acquire.com slash Arvid. 
me and see for yourself if this is the right option for you, your business at this time. You might just want to wait a bit and see if it works out half a year from now or a year from now. Just check it out. It's always good to be in the know. Thank you for listening to the Bootstrap Founder today. I really appreciate that. You can find me on Twitter at Avidkal, A R V A D K A H L. And you find my books and my Twitter course there too. If you want to support me and this show, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, get the podcast in your podcast player of choice, whatever that might be. Do let me know. It would be interesting to see. And leave a rating and a review by going to ratethispodcast.com slash founder. It really makes a big difference if you show up there because then this podcast shows up in other people's feeds. And that's, I think, where we all would like it to be, just helping other people learn and see and understand new things. Any of this will help the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful day and bye-bye.